This video has been brought to you by the Partnership for Conflict, Crime, and Security Research. Hi, my name is Kate McNeil, and I'm the Communications Officer for the Partnership for Conflict, Crime, and Security Research. This summer, we're sitting down with researchers working on projects as part of the ESRC-funded call on transnational organized crime, deepening and broadening our understanding. These projects are exploring the complex and ever-evolving socio-political and socio-technical environments within which transnational organized crime operates. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by the University of Oxford's Dr. Raphael Lefebvre and the University of Kent's Professor Caroline Rooney to discuss their work on the crime terror nexus in Lebanon. Welcome both. Raphael, would you mind getting started by telling me a little bit about your research background and about what brought you to this research project? Sure, so my background is in Middle Eastern politics. Um, I uh, started developing a passion for uh, this region, for the Middle East, uh, after living in uh, Syria in 2010 and in Lebanon in 2012 to 2016, where I conducted my doctoral and my postdoctoral uh, research. And I soon became interested in particular in local politics, as I realized that there was a gap between the sometimes big picture macro analysis of the Middle East and the local realities lived by many people uh, on the ground. And one place I became especially interested in and wanted to do more research on was Tripoli. Tripoli is the second city of Lebanon. It is a main trade hub uh, situated close to the Lebanese-Syrian border uh, in the north of Lebanon. It is also a city with a very, very rich history. But in the Lebanese and Western media, it is a city which has become portrayed in very dark ways as a city of extremism, as a city of violence, as a city of criminality, indeed. And so I moved to and lived in Tripoli, uh, where I wanted to investigate whether these outside perceptions really matched with the local reality on the ground. And I found out that far from a place completely dominated by crime and terror, Tripoli was a diverse city, a city not easily fitting uh, the stereotypes that it has earned. Um, and although there was um, a lot of criminal and extremist activities going on in the city, they were mostly focused on some neighborhoods especially. And so this really opened up my eyes to the need to grasp nuances, uh, the need to bridge the gap between the perceptions of outsiders and the local realities, the local complexities as well of the ground. And I think one anecdote really struck me, which directly informed uh, the research project that Caroline and I are now undertaking. It was the story of Shadi al-Maulawi. Shadi al-Maulawi uh, was, uh, was, was a Tripolitan resident of the district of Ebbe on the outskirts of Tripoli, one of the most impoverished parts of the city. Shadi al-Maulawi gained prominence in 2012 in the Lebanese and Western media when the Lebanese government called him the public enemy number one of the country, mostly because he was part criminal and part terrorist. Part criminal because Shadi al-Maulawi was back then the head of a gang smuggling weapons to Syria, and part terrorist because he was a known associate of the Al-Qaeda-linked Al-Nusra Front. But although Shadi al-Maulawi was, because of his criminal and terrorist background, despised by many Tripolitans and by many Lebanese, he was a local hero in his neighborhood of Ebbe, where a lot of the people hailed him as a modern time Robin Hood, as the defender of the local community, as the avenger of the poor, as a provider of some goods and services, as someone who expressed their grievances. And so when the Lebanese army eventually arrested Shadi al-Maulawi because of his criminal and terrorist activities, it soon had to release him because the outburst of popular anger in his neighborhood of Ebbe was such that uh, the Lebanese army feared a mass uprising in the neighborhood and in the city. So this anecdote really made Caroline and I wonder 
uh, why and how can transnational organized crime sometimes become so rooted locally? Made us want to also investigate the nature of the relationship between crime and terrorism. So these are some of the key themes and questions and context as well, uh, which guide uh, our research project so far. Caroline, how did you end up working on this project? Well, um, Kate, my recent work has been on Arab uprisings, um, mainly the first phase. So it's been of great interest to me when the Lebanese revolution began in October um, of last year, that Tripoli was at the forefront of it, um, Tripoli being called the bride of the revolution. Um, I think that it's fair to say that all of these revolutions have been against what people see as the corruption and negligence um, of neoliberal elites, really. Um, th this being seen, actually, by many of them as a form of criminality um, in their eyes. Many of the protesters see this negligence as a form of criminality. Um, and in this regard, I'd like to draw attention to some of the statements that have been made in terms of the recent revolutionary movement. Um, the Tripoli uprisings um, convey their messages as uh, other uprisings have done through things like graffiti. And there's one graffiti image of a man holding a, a peace sign. And he is saying, um, the little speech blurb that comes from his mouth says, um, fighting corruption, fighting sectarianism, fighting violence. Um, in addition to the graffiti, the, the chants have proved very telling. One of them is, thieves, thieves, I want to live, I want to breathe. I want to find a job in Lebanon. I want everything they stole from me. Um, and in a CNN interview, um, a resident of Tripoli states, um, the solution is for the army chief to round up all the politicians and put them in the jail. In um, a Guardian interview, a woman speaks of how um, livelihoods and salaries are being stolen and um, she, this is confirmed by another man who's also interviewed. So it's what is striking is that while Tripoli has been demonized, as Raphael has said, um, as this extremist city, the, the protesters are calling um, those that um, the, those that they see as responsible for their woes as the corrupt politicians. Um, yeah, so uh, uh, a revolutionary, Lina Khatib, states that the scenes in Tripoli have been deeply moving because many had written the, the city off um, as, as a hub of extremism. Uh, so um, what, what, the, what this recent uprising shows is that, um, that, that Tripoli does also have the capacity to, to be um, a creative hub and the movement was characterized by inclusiveness and festiveness, reflecting the, the warmth and hospitality of the, the city that Raphael has found these other aspects to Tripoli. Um, and I think that in spite of its problems, it's very important to realize that um, it, it can't be seen in a, in a, a place that is just homogenous. Um, and its potential um, could be drawn on in, in ways um, that could be supported further. Raphael, what gaps does this research project seek to fill? So Caroline and I are seeking to make uh, two main contributions uh, to the literature uh, in security studies on uh, transnational organized crime and on terrorism. Um, the first contribution is really to undertake um, a history and a sociology as well of crime and terrorism in Tripoli. So what we want to do is really to look at the local context which has uh, favored the rise of some of these criminal and extremist organizations over the past 20, 25 years in Tripoli, which has given such a bad image, as Caroline was just saying, uh, to the city. Um, so what we want to do here is really to map out who the main criminal and terrorist actors are in Tripoli, but also in which neighborhoods they operate, what local contexts they are operating in. And this is all quite important because Tripoli remains an enigma. It remains an enigma for a lot of the Lebanese and Western policymakers who are working on Lebanese politics, it also remains an enigma for researchers because a lot of the attention has been focused 
on the crime and terror landscape and the political landscape at large in Lebanon, on Beirut in particular, thus overlooking the country's second city of uh, Tripoli. So we're really hoping that our work on the history and the sociology of crime and terror in Tripoli will bring nuance to some of the discussions uh, currently going on on Tripoli and, and, and that it would also highlight this broader context that I was talking about, a broader context marked, for instance, by a lot of poverty. Uh, Tripoli is a city in which 57 persons, so over half of all residents, live under the poverty line. So these are contexts, I think, worth highlighting, and they are in and of themselves uh, a contribution, because they contribute to our understanding of the crime and terror landscape uh, in Tripoli. But second, and perhaps most importantly, we're not just interested in Tripoli for the sake of Tripoli. Rather, we really want to try to uh, derive broader insights from our local micro uh, field research in Tripoli to understand the broader role of the local, the local in how transnational criminal organizations and also extremist groups operate. So criminal and extremist organizations are often seen as very clandestine uh, organizations, movements operating remotely and driven by global aims. And this is partially true, but our research also suggests that these groups are also rooted sometimes extremely deeply in some places especially, and that local dynamics are also really key to understanding how they operate. So what we really try to do is to sort of point out uh, the ways in which these transnational criminal and extremist organizations draw on inherently local dynamics in order to recruit followers, in order to expand, in order to strengthen their networks. What we do is essentially to highlight the local politics of global phenomena, such as transnational organized crime or extremism. Would you mind elaborating a little bit on about how you've gone about conducting this research? According to the analysis that we have conducted of this research, of this trove of data, uh, two thirds of all Tripolitans currently being held on terrorism charges hail from three neighborhoods of Tripoli specifically and only. Uh, so there is a clear neighborhood effect at play there. And most of them have uh, a criminal past as well. So it does suggest uh, that, that there is a local specificity that we have to then examine, uh, investigate. And this is the second part of uh, the way in which we conducted our research. Um, I went to Tripoli twice in the past year in order to conduct interviews in some of these three neighborhoods in which crime and terror uh, uh, thrive. Um, and so I went in particular to one neighborhood called al Mankubin. al Mankubin is the name of one of Tripoli's most infamous uh, neighborhoods. It means in English, the damaged ones. And its name hints at the terrible socioeconomic and political condition in which the residents of this essentially slum uh, live in. Um, this is a neighborhood in which 87% of the local residents live under the poverty line. This is a district once again in which illiteracy and unemployment are incredibly high, much higher than the uh, city average. Uh, it is also a neighborhood in which as a result there is a lot of social and political anger at the Lebanese government because of its inaction, also at local elites and at uh, local politicians. Um, on this fertile ground, terrorists and uh, criminal organizations have rooted uh, themselves and as a result uh, criminal networks, Salafi jihadi networks proliferate. So it has become a neighborhood stigmatized by a lot of Tripolitans as being extremely unsafe and uh, it's quite telling that when I went there uh, six months ago I found it very difficult to actually find a research assistant to accompany me in this neighborhood because no one essentially wanted to go there. Uh, it says a lot about the stigma that still sticks to this neighborhood. 
um, I went there uh, nonetheless and found a research assistant uh, to help me build local networks. And I was struck by the dozens of life stories I gathered there, life stories indicating um, how people's livelihoods are being impacted by transnational organized crime, by terrorist activity, and, and also the ways in which these groups uh, use local grievances in order to root themselves locally. Uh, so that has been the qualitative aspect of our research, uh, building upon the quantitative data that we had gathered from the Lebanese Interior Ministry. And the third step, the final step, of our project, which we haven't been able to uh, start yet, unfortunately, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, is going to consist of partnering with three local organizations in Tripoli in order to um, organize a series of workshops. Now, these workshops are aimed at, of course, generating data for our research, but also at exerting an impact on the ground. So, we're partnering with three organizations, I said, just want to name them because they do a really great job. Uh, they include March, which is a Lebanese Tripolitan uh, local NGO doing a lot of uh, very good work on countering uh, violent extremism. Uh, another of these NGOs is the Burger Foundation, which is an international NGO uh, holding dialogue sessions throughout Lebanon, but also in Tripoli. Um, and the third, uh, association is the Carnegie Middle East Center, which is the uh, Lebanese Middle Eastern branch of the U.S. think tank, the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, and it is a prominent local advocacy group. So the goal, as I said, of the workshops that we're going to be organizing uh, with these three project partners is to bring together local activists in Tripoli in order to uh, construct a network but also talk a lot about transnational organized crime, about terrorism, and we're aiming to bring together not just civil society activists, but also local practitioners, policy makers, uh, residents interested in the topic, and ex-convicts. Uh, so the goal here is, as I said, not just to obtain data on crime and terror in Tripoli, but also to make an impact. We're hoping that this uh, series of workshops will empower uh, these actors on the ground who are committed to building human security uh, from below. Thank you. Um, and what have been some of your research findings thus far? So based on our research, we have identified uh, two main strategies through which criminal and terrorist uh, groups are able to root themselves locally in some neighborhoods especially and again the findings are not just triply specific they also apply to a lot of other contexts elsewhere as well and the first of the strategy used by criminal and extremist groups in order to root themselves locally is to draw on local solidarities so we have observed in Tripoli uh, quite a few senior officials in criminal and extremist organizations um, seeking to marry with the daughters or the sisters of uh, male local residents of the neighborhoods in which these groups try to gain a foothold. Uh, and this is, of course, aimed at setting up local alliances. It's quite important uh, when it comes to these groups obtaining protection, obtaining uh, a mandate to operate uh, in impunity in these territories. Uh, we've also seen some of these groups co-opting not just committed followers, but also informal leaders of neighborhoods, essentially neighborhood strongmen, uh, people who have a locally high status and use uh, uh, the criminal or extremist organization for their own interest in exchange for making available to them their networks of followers. So this helps these organizations to recruit and again to operate at the local level. This is quite important once more because by drawing on local solidarities, criminal and extremist groups are then able to portray themselves as the defenders of the local community, which is something that I think security practitioners have often uh, overlooked. The second strategy through which 
um, criminal and extremist actors are able to root themselves at the local level is their willingness to tackle local grievances. And this is quite important once more because in extremely deprived, poor neighborhoods, these groups sometimes provide, provide jobs, provide perhaps small, but sometimes crucial services, such as food once in a while, uh, or access to water or to basic healthcare. But most importantly, these groups increasingly act as a vehicle uh, through which the local residents of these neighborhoods voice their grievances, voice their social and political anger at the Lebanese government, at the local elite, at local political parties. And this is quite crucial because it gives an inherently political, a protest dimension to criminal and extremist groups otherwise portrayed in the media as only driven by profits or by ideology. So the bottom line in uh, all of this, uh, our main finding so far is that although these criminal and extremist groups are driven by a transnational agenda, by global aims, you can say, they are still skilled at exploiting the local solidarities and the local grievances uh, to root themselves and to expand. And this, this I think, really shows that um, we need to factor in much more than we have until now the importance of the local in studying much more global phenomena such as transnational organized crime or again terrorism. And Caroline, how did you come to draw on arts and culture as part of this project? I do this in several ways. Um, I find that um, local writers often act as the scribes of their communities. They know their histories, their troubles, their aspirations, their legends, um, and their array of characters, as it were. For instance, the gangster type and the Robin Hood gangster type that Raphael has spoken of um, often appears in Arabic fiction as the Futawa, or strongman of the alley. And as Raphael has said, he, he may be a criminal, but he also helps the community. Um, and, and this is a very specific phenomenon that's um, interesting to look at how it is written about. Um, a recent novel about Tripoli that interests me is Jabo Duhai's The American Quarter. Um, it actually is a story about how a young man becomes radicalized. And um, it's a story that fits very much with the stories that um, have been emerging from the interviews. You know, he becomes a petty criminal. Um, his um, sense of hopelessness and, and abandonment is, as it were, exploited by um, Islamists in the community. Um, and I suppose what's interesting here is that the appeal of Islamism is often not as ideological as it is presumed to be, but can be due to material and emotional and psychological vulnerabilities. Um, so th this is something that I've also explored in a book I've just published called Creative Radicalism in the Middle East. Um, and in this book, I trace how extremism on the one hand and creative radicalism on the other, such as emerges with the revolutions, emerge out of the same conditions, but they take different trajectories. Um, so here, as regards Tripoli, I'm particularly interested in the work that March, our project partner, has been doing, using the arts to mend rifts in communities and to empower people. So it's not a case of this creative radicalism being about making art for the sake of making art, but it's how arts and popular culture being used across the Middle East to rebuild um, divided communities to advance civic engagement and participation. Um, and it's a case really that, of providing alternatives to the kind of um, solutions offered by the, the Islamists. Um, so yeah, um, here I, a previous documentary film I made called White Flags explores how citizens in Beirut um, are using a, a variety of means to mend sectarian ravages, build trust, and to rebuild and reconstitute civil society. Um, <clears throat> and I'm very interested to sort of see what specific um, variations we find in the, the Tripoli context around this, and very much looking forward to the documentary we hope to make um, that we've sadly had to postpone due to the pandemic. Um, but I think it, it will be important to, for us to show 
the, the neighborhood through the eyes of its residents um, so that local vicissitudes might be understood from their perspectives. Um, because this will be a means of um, drawing attention to their sense of desperate conditions, which I think is an increasingly problematic situation, um, so that we must work on thinking of how we might confront these and alleviate these um, situations, um, but with both civic participation of those we work with and um, with NGO support as well. We're just about out of time, but Raphael, Caroline, thank you both for joining me today to talk about your research. It's much appreciated. And to all of those watching, thanks for listening. If you want to learn more about PAX and our research, you can visit our website at www.paxresearch.org.uk. Thanks again.